going to introduce a, an integrated system for arena sport analysis and we are going to do the case study for football specifically and soccer in some countries. Anyways, among those names, uh, this is mine and you can just call me Vamsi. So the outline of today's talk is going to be just motivation. Why do we need such a system in the first case? And then a large part of the presentation is going to be about the system, even though I still had to skip a lot of details. But uh, then I'll present the scenario in a really beautiful city up in the north. It's Alfheim or Tromso. The name of the stadium is Alfheim. And then I'll present a small discussion about what's happening now and what's going to happen later. So motivation. Well, the thing is that sport analysis has been around since a long time, from bars and pubs where two old people sit and discuss what's happening, what's wrong in the game, to using technology to actually analyze what's happening in the game. And there are these two notable things. One is ProZone, which has been in use since some time now. And uh, Camargas is a new system, which, is, which has come into light recently, 2012, 2011. But the problem is that each of these systems analyze these problems at individual level. Like some of them do just the video analysis part, where they capture multiple uh, streams, and then they try to analyze from these videos. And there are some systems, like ProZone, which uh, automate the process of annotation from an expert, like a coach or somebody who knows what actually football is and how it works. And there are some other systems which just give information about player statistics, like their velocity, their position, or heart rate, or, well, how long have been running. But the idea that we wanted to explore was how do we put all these things together at one place and provide automation at several levels? Like now, if you want to mix these systems, you still have to take the expert annotation from one system and then mark them out in the videos in the other system. So what we wanted was to put all these things at one place. That's where we came up with this system, Bagadus. It's not just a piece of hardware or a part of software or something that's small. It's a whole system. With this, we have, at this moment, it's a prototype. But we have a video subsystem, which handles most of the visual information, a tracking subsystem, which handles most of the player statistics, like where they are, what they're doing, and what's their heart rate and an analytic subsystem where it tracks what are the events that are happening from an expert and, well, a few hidden bugs that we don't like to see now and then. And then this is the architecture. So we have football field, and we put a few sensors on the players. It's not acceptable in some countries, but it is in some. So anyways, we push the boundaries. So for now, we are trying to push it. And we collect information from these transceivers. Well, they actually don't look like that around the football field. It's just for illustration purposes, which receive the information from players. And they store these statistics into a sensor subsystem. Now, for the visual information itself, we have a few cameras placed outside the field, just a bit above the field, several cameras. And they span the area in this fashion. They're not really complete overlap, but sufficient enough to make something like a panorama or something later that we want to do. So for now, we just have a panorama pipeline. We just wanted to see how things work, So which has basically a capturing, then a bit of undistortion, and also warping, and then stitching, and storing these frames onto a video subsystem. But at the same time, we thought, OK, we might need the individual videos from the cameras as well. So we have another pipeline which handles the outputs from each of these single cameras. It just captures, uh, encodes, and stores them onto the disk. So at this moment, you have four videos from these four cameras and a stitched panorama video. That includes the video subsystem. And then we have an expert, a coach or a manager, who's often quite angry. And he, what he does is he just uses a small mobile device, types into it, uh, I'm going to do a small detail of how these things are organized. But he just types into the, by touch, just gives an input. And then it's stored into the analytics subsystem. OK, we store all these things together really nicely and really beautifully. But then what do we do with this? 
One thing that we have explored is having a user interaction and retrieval. So there is a user that just says, OK, I need this piece of place where this happened. Then the system has to automatically read, decode the frames. Well, if he says, I want to zoom into what's happening there, then zoom in there and yeah, mark the players and encode it because it has to be sent over the network, and then it's sent there. For now, we have developed two viewing modes. One is camera switching, and one is panorama viewing mode, where in one, if you're tracking a player, and if the player runs from one camera to the other one, it just switches the camera. In panorama view, you see all of it, but it's still not that good, let's say. So one of the really big challenge to have so many sensors, so many things capturing data at a really high rate, I mean, 30 frames per second, well, some of you might not think it's high, but it is actually quite a high rate. And to have a synchronization between these, one is between the cameras itself, there are four cameras, and the other is between this video system and the tracking subsystem, is a bit challenging. For the cameras, what we, hand, what we did was we just synchronized all the shutters using an external device that sends in signals at the same time without any jitters, pretty much. For the video uh, system to the tracking system, we have established the network time protocol, and then we try to keep track of it. Well, I have to say that sometimes we don't really get synchronized. and it's still a bit of a trouble now. So going to the video subsystem, what we need is basically to capture the visual information. For this, as I mentioned, we have cameras somewhere located at 10 meters away from the field and 10 meters above the ground. And we are using, at the moment, four industrial cameras from Basler. Well, it's for prototyping, so we are not really using really high-quality cameras, just recording at 30 frames per second with 3.5 mm wide lenses. And we have, in each camera, a one-third inch sensor, which can capture 1,280 by 960 pixels each. Like HD, pretty much. And we have a code, North Light, we call it, because in Norway it's kind of nice to have them. And that library manages all the capturing and the storing of the cameras, even some of the synchronization protocol that has been under development. But we have to still look into the details for that one. And then this is, well, I named it Digital Zoom, but technically it's interpolation, because we use it at a lot of steps. One is when we do undistortion from the cameras, because the cameras we have have really wide lenses, so there are some geometric distortions that are introduced by them. So what we did is a small benchmarking of what kind of interpolation techniques. I mean, these are really textbook techniques. These are not something at the state of the art. But we just benchmark them so that if whenever we use them in the pipeline, we just pick the one that is most useful for us. So I'm going to present this one as well, which, as you can see, we opted for nearest neighbor or bilinear in most cases, not the big ones. Then going on to the panorama stitching itself. For this, we had to do a bit of undistortion, debarreling. When we use such wide lenses, the images are optically distorted, so we had to get them straight lines straight and yeah, players to look normal. And then we warp them onto a common plane. Well, for now, uh, I'm going to show an example of planar uh, panorama. But we have explored other ones as well, like cylindrical, spherical. So we just have to warp onto the surface. And then do a bit of brightness correction, because even though the cameras are all the same, you still have some sort of differences between the lighting conditions from one view to the other one. And then we stitch them together using at the moment, just a straight uh, cut, but we are also exploring new things now. So the process looks this way, the one that I explained pretty much. You get to see this panorama. It's not the most beautiful panorama you have seen, but it's OK. And these are the other ones. The first one is the cylindrical, and the second one is planar. Don't get confused by the sizes. They are resized to fit into the presentation. The second one is actually much bigger than the first one. And the spherical and the perspective-based stitching. So what we did here was benchmarking how much time would this take. I, we didn't write the stitching code 
at this at that point. We just use the functions from OpenCV be because they are useful and they are nice. So we figured out that using OpenCV functions, the stitching process for the panorama is actually quite large. It's about 17, uh, 1.7 seconds per frame. And we tried homography stitching, which is a perspective-based stitching, where you just uh, warp these images onto this plane and put them together. This one seemed something that we can optimize and get to real time, let's say. It's not close to real time now. So we went into the pipeline of the stitching, and we we benchmark each of these processes, like which one is exactly the one that's taking the longest time. And we figured out that the actual warping and the stitching part is the one that is taking the longest. The rest of the panorama pipeline is pretty much real time. It just needs a bit of code optimization, and everything else is quite real time. So yeah, that's uh, where the video subsystem ends. And we have the tracking system. Tracking is not exactly a new problem. In computer vision fields, people have been using cameras to track objects since some time now. But we just followed a new approach by not using just the visual information. Because as you can see, even eyes have troubles when trying to follow players on TVs or uh, any of the video outputs. So we cannot really expect the machine to perform better than that. So what we did is, OK, we'll put a few sensors on the players and capture their exact locations. And instead of tracking them on their space, we just transform these onto the camera space and store the data there. And we'll have a perfect, pretty much perfect location of each of the players. So this is what we incorporated into this. And for the analytics itself, what we do is instead of the coach writing on a piece of paper and then feeding that system into a video system later on. We provide a mobile app where he can select a class of events, like attack or tackle or defense. Or he can also add a new class. And then he can just select the player and then just push a button. Then it's stored at that event, at that moment, as an event. And yeah, it's simple. It's easy to use. No, no, <laughs> it just it just sends to the system that, OK, there is an event here. So Alfheim is a stadium up in Tromso. And well, in Tromso, we have challenging conditions. One is the climate and well, light. Oh, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Temperature is, I think it's a bit colder. So yeah. <laughs> so we did a small case study saying that, OK, we have all this system. If we want a query, we just ask Ling, saying, OK, this player, give me all the instances where this player has a heart rate above this much. Or give me an instance where this player is in the 18-yard box in the second half, or any of these queries. And we tried benchmarking, OK, how much time does it take to retrieve this sort of information? It's a simple one of the database languages sort of queries. Well, we haven't developed an interface for it yet to make it look beautiful. So it's still in coding terms. And when you actually send in the query, the video on the system starts at around 670 milliseconds. And the benchmarking details are these. The receival of query happens at around 2.7 milliseconds. And the video frame is displayed on the, at, at now we are using a Linux machine at 670 milliseconds. So well, I think that's pretty much the system. I skipped a lot of details. So if you have any questions later on, you can ask me. I'm going to show a small preview. The first one is where it's the camera switching mode, where if you select a player or multiple players, it automatically switches the cameras to show what's which, ca which view is the player in. This is the small demo on Linux machine. And that's the interface where you can select 1, 2, 3, 22 players, if all of them are on the field.
Yeah, almost when he leaves, because there is an overlap area, so we have a line in between where he can cross, and it still looks like it's doing a predictive, but it's yeah, it's it's reactive. And then this is a panorama preview. As I said, it's not the most beautiful panorama you have seen so far, so just don't judge the panorama. <laughs> Yeah, that's the beauty of it, right? You don't need to switch the cameras. <laughs> and this game is playing at noon, or is it uh <laughs> Well, if you play at noon in winter, it looks like this, let's say. <laughs> and the case where an event is demanded is like a, sim a simple event. Well, it's called a sample event in this case, sample attack. And it just plays out the annotated event, where this event was annotated by the coach. And then it, it shows on the event list on the left-hand bottom. I, I don't know if you can actually read If you have really good sight, maybe yes. So these are the three previews. And well, this was when we submitted the paper for this conference. So it's a bit long back. So what's happening now is that we already have a real-time panorama pipeline on a GPU. You just have the cameras, and you can almost instantly see the panorama being constructed or built. If you want to see the demo for it, it's up in the lab. We thought of putting it down here, but then we thought that with that machine making so much of noise, we would not really have a conference going on here. So, <laughs> so we just put it up in the lab, and if you want, you can have a look at it. And we, are, uh, we also improved the quality of the panorama in general. We put in more computer vision things into the pipeline, color correction, go, uh, the ghost removal. Also, we are uh, going for a better camera setup to remove the parallax, because in the initial case, we had problems in setting up the camera, so we had to set them up quite far. And as you know, if the optical centers are not at the same point, the panorama has a problem with the parallax and gives ghosting effects. You could actually observe them in the panorama. And we are going for a 2K sensor system, because to zoom in, you get if you zoom in, you don't get a really good quality now. But if you have a high resolution capture, then you can actually get good quality. And also non-wide lenses to reduce the distortion optically. And well, these two are more at experimental stage now. One is to develop a free viewpoint at regions of interest, like at the goalposts. We set up extra cameras which look at the same place, and then we construct viewpoint. Well, this has been done at some places already, but what we want is real time again. And automatic virtual camera generation, well, now you see the panorama. That's not really something that you want to show to somebody. What you would like to have is when you select the player, you would like to have a virtual camera following that player automatically. And this can be done from the texture of the panorama pretty much. But we are looking into this problem at this moment. So to conclude the talk, we presented a prototype system for Arena Sport Analysis. And well, it's a collaborative effort, because as you can see, there is a lot of video processing, uh, processing compu on computers and networks and hardware things involved, embedded systems as well. And we have benchmarked uh, some of the processes, and we are working on optimizing those results. And then we started working on the new setup, which brought us new challenges, and so a new research. And also, we like football a lot. So these are the references, if you have any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do you consider um, leveraging uh, all these attendees who uh, capture the, the scene with their smartphones? Do you, do you think, I mean, do you know any way to uh, leverage these videos? Well, it could be an interesting idea. Actually, there is one research that they do. When you have a smartphone, you, t you capture a picture, and you can estimate your location or estimate where you're sitting from a panorama. 
but for us we need uh, the the, prop, the most important thing for us was the real time thing okay one is to deliver to the audience but the second or the actually the most priority is to have the coach or to show this immediately in the dressing room almost immediately if you capture things on smartphones then let's say i don't know how many people can we have in a stadium around 50000 and providing bandwidth for 50000 smartphones to transfer images at that high rate is is uh, a bit challenging at this moment i think <laughs> so yeah we haven't looked into it but we'll keep a note of it so So I'm outing myself. I haven't read your paper so far, which I should have done to do my homework. So I apologize if this question is answered in your paper in advance. But um, you know, by looking around, being a big football fan myself, but also you know living in the U.S. and see what the media is doing with like you know the football where they mainly use their hands called American football. Um, there's a lot of commercial products out like th this, and and um, I haven't. Can you can you kind of kind of highlight what's what's different? Uh, in your case, to these commercial products, I've never, you know, it's probably hard to get the information what they do. But do you, do you have any idea what's different to the commercial stuff that's out there? Yeah, the commercial products are like I explained. The ones that are really famous are Prozone and Camargus, which is coming into light now. Which are Camargus was actually uh, a sort of side waste company of Maxi Zoom or Max Zoom one of those companies which were actually using their systems for American football quite some time back. But as I said, the problem with those was, for example, Prozone does the uh, annotation pretty much automatically. Like it does take uh, event from the coaches and keeps them at some place. And Camargas or these MaxiZoom operate on the video or visual information pretty much automatically. But the problem is putting these things together at one place, like okay, you, st you still have this, all these events information, all these player statistics, and all these video information, but they're not really connected to each other. They're still on separate systems. When you want to have uh, just a general request saying like, just give me the video where a player is standing or player is running f with a heart rate of 180 for more than 10 seconds, then you cannot really have it from there. You still have to manually integrate all these things. So what we are trying to achieve is to have all the, all of this information at one place, so that well that that's the basic idea, so that any query is handled automatically behind uh, behind the screen. Any further question? Yes. Have you actually um, uh, so you've deployed the system, but have you actually also created a user interface so that the coach can you know, after the match, show the analytics uh, to the players and tell them what they did wrong? Yeah, we did, but it's, uh, it, it was more of an experiment and they really liked it as well. They did like it? Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> That's why we got more interest and more support from people. <laughs> Any more question? If it is not the case, then thank you very much again for okay, the interesting talk. You.